We can also use Moran's eye in a, in a hypothesis test. And the way we do this is by assuming that Moran's eye, the statistic that we compute, is normally distributed. And we can standardize a Moran's eye into a z-score. All we have to do is subtract from Moran's eye the expected value of Moran's eye if x was totally random. So what would Moran's eye be if x was totally random? We've already decided earlier that Moran's eyes close to zero are, are random Moran's eyes. So we're going to put over here something close to zero. It's not quite zero. And then all we have to do is divide by the standard error. In this case, we're calling that the square root of the variance of i. Uh, once we know a z-score for each i, we can determine whether or not that Moran's i is significant or not. So if we have a normal curve, over here we're going to have a z equals zero. That's the case when i is going to equal the expected value of i if x was totally random. Then we'll have a z of zero. If we have a z out here in one of the tails, a high z-score, say z equals 3, is going to imply positive autocorrelation because our i is large in comparison to 0. And down over here, a z, say, of minus 2 is going to imply significant negative autocorrelation because our i is much less than 0, something close to minus 1. In either case, if we have z's within this zone of acceptance, you know, be, before the in between the two critical values, then we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis that Moran's i is is zero, or that there's no space. The null hypothesis is that there's no spatial pattern that x is randomly distributed. Now we're going to see equations for the expected value of i. But the variance of i is way too complicated to, to understand at our level of mathematics and, and our knowledge of probability. So we're just going to be using the computer to calculate z-scores from Moran's i. We're never going to have to, say, calculate the value of this uh, standard error manually. But here we have the expected value of Moran's i under the hypothesis of no spatial autocorrelation. And remember before I said that Moran's i equal to zero implies no autocorrelation. But really the truth is that Moran's i can only equal zero if n, if the sample size is infinitely large. But in the case when we don't have infinitely sized samples, so essentially in all cases, we are going to calculate the, uh, the expected value of Moran's i as just minus 1 over n minus 1, where n is the sample size. So you can see that as n approaches larger and larger numbers, the expected value of i is going to get closer and closer to 0. So say we only have a sample of 5 points, in that case, a Moran's i of minus 1 over 4 is what we expect to see, or minus 0 0.25. If we only have 5 points, then we expect to see a slightly negative Moran's i, even if the data were random. But if we have, say, a 1,000 points, then we expect to see Moran's i at minus 1 over 999, which is something like, zero p or minus zero point zero zero uh, one. Okay, so that's something that's much, much closer to zero than this case. So the expected value of Moran's i gets pretty close to zero when we have larger and larger sample sizes. All of this over here is what we need to do to compute the variance of Moran's i.
because remember we're going to use the square root of the variance down here in order to standardize the i the i statistic into a z score this is way too complicated to do by hand so don't worry about it at all for now just know that it that it's not magic we just apply this formula the computer when you ask for a moran's i is going to apply this formula in order to provide you with a z score for a given level of autocorrelation